follow along, but I want to dive right in. Thank you, musicians. I want to jump right in this morning to what Holy Spirit has given me. And I'm going to be very, very honest about uh, what He's given me and how He's given it to me. So, you know, a lot of times um, He will give me a word, He'll give me something, and He really opens up the whole, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this so it makes sense, but He'll open up the whole window so I can see everything that's in it. I have a real clear perspective of everything that's in that room, even if he hasn't put it, put it together yet for me, I have a clear idea of what the sum total of that might be or look like. This is one of those words, and those of you that have been a part of The Rock for any length of time, you know that I'm all, always excited to stand behind this pulpit and to teach when I have a completed word in me, and even when I have an incomplete word in me. There are times like today that we're going to move into a series. It's today, maybe next week, maybe three weeks, I'm not sure, until we're finished. But there are times like today when he's been dealing with me, and I think I might have touched on this a little bit last week. I can never remember who I talked to about what. But there are times like today that he will begin to move in me and stir me Long before the day, so before today, he began to change some things in me or awaken me to some thoughts, and he'll begin to develop the thoughts. Well, most of the time, by the time I stand up here and preach to you, those thoughts are completely developed. Today, those aren't developed. Today, we're taking a journey through this series. I know what it is he's wanting us to move towards It's how we get there that is the unknown right now. So one of the things that I say to the preachers, the pastors, the teachers, whoever has ever stood behind this pulpit, often I will say to them, if you'll do this one thing, then you will do well. And I'll tell them, know the end from the beginning. And anyone who's ever stood up here knows that I've said that. Anybody that's been in any of my classes, I've said, know the end from the beginning. In other words, if I'm aware of where I'm going, getting there will be a journey that makes complete sense to everyone else. Today, I know where I'm beginning, but I don't have the end. So if while I'm speaking today... In you, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, and I want to say to you that are watching online, I'm very thankful that you're watching, and let me just make this announcement. On September the 24th, we will be back in Michigan. Uh, A.J. Phillips will be there ministering on that day at the Fairfield Inn and Suites in Grand Blank. So I encourage you to let everyone know uh, that is Sunday, uh, September 24th, and that is in Grand Blank at the Fairfield Inn on Holly Road. So, but I can tell you whether you're in this room or you're watching online today, you, if you have questions about something that I might say today, that's good. It's okay. If I don't have an answer to the question, that's good and okay too. Because I think the very nature of having a question speaks of the very subject we're teaching on. It leans towards the need for the subject I'll be talking about today. So, how many have a cell phone? Hold your hand up. Smartphone. It could be a dumb phone, whatever kind of phone. But you have a phone. Everybody in here, everybody under the sound of my voice, or most everybody, has a cell phone. How many text? Doesn't matter how you text, slow, fast, voice. I send another, t- it happens to me every week, I send another voice text. Liz, I sent, it was actually a voice email, I sent it to Liz. And then you probably looked at it and thought, man, he needs help. And uh, I sent her a voice email, and then after she replied to my email, I saw mine, and I was like, oh, my Lord. I hope she forgives me. And uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It just was missing some words. And, uh, but she interpreted it. She's known me long enough. She knew my point. So, but you send text. You send, whether you type them, you voice them, which for me, 99.9% of the time is voice. I almost am never using my fingers to text. I'll hold it up, talk to her, say, 
text this person this message, they'll send it. Usually, I will check it. If I'm driving in my car and my phone's down there and I speak over the Bluetooth, I don't get to check it. So that's usually when you're going to get something that is... Um, it needs healing. So, but you're texting and you're sending these messages and you have an option, at least on the iPhone. I don't know if that's true on Samsung or not. I'm not sure if they've caught up yet. But there, you have an option on iPhone that when you text, you can select, manually select, whether or not people know that you have read your texts. You can select that. For me, it's off. So if you send me a text, you're never going to know if I read it unless I reply. That's just it, because it, it just is. Now you know. And um, so I don't, I, I have it off. I've always had it off. I've never had it on. There's never been a time that I've had that on. I, I enjoy privacy. I enjoy taking my time to respond to things, but I will respond. I will respond. So I have this rule that most of you know about. I reply to emails at 3 o'clock every day. It's just this easy way for me to do it. So if you send me an email at 10, sometimes I'll email earlier if I get a moment. But at 3 o'clock is when the bulk of my replies are going to happen in email. Text, whenever I can get to it, I'll reply to a text. But you have an option of having read receipts on your text. So, you know, I heard someone say not too long ago, this statement about whatever they were dialoguing about or corresponding about a, a conversation that they had had via text, and, and someone said, and they left me on read. And I thought, what does that mean? They left you on read. Because in my mind, I'm thinking R-E-D, not R-E-A-D. So what does that mean, left on red? Then last week, I was at lunch, and the Holy Spirit had already begun to stir me about the content of this word. But I was at lunch, and my son said something about being left on red, and I said, what does that mean? And he said, you know, when, they, when somebody sends a text, and you get the message that they read it, but they don't respond. And they leave you there. Y'all laugh like you do that. So what's funny right now is this. How many of you actually don't know people know that they read it? You, do, you actually don't know that when you read it, it sent them a message and said, read. That's what's funny. <laughs> so all this time you thought, they don't know whether I read it or not. And at the same time, all of that same time, they're thinking, they left me on red. Mm -hmm. Everybody's looking at their phone right now. I see all the heads down and you're going to your settings right now. Do I have read receipts on? So I said last week, I said when Joshua said that, I said, that's what I want to preach on. That's what I want to call this series that Holy Spirit is working in me left on red because it works so perfectly with what it is that He wants to do. So I'm going to give you an example this morning. So I sent out a text message to over 200 people this morning. Over 200 people this morning at 7.50 a.m. I sent out a text message and all it said was, You've been chosen. And I got five replies. Huh? Yours wouldn't let you reply? How many got it, but it wouldn't let you reply? I have you blocked. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I do not. I do not have you blocked. Nobody in this room. But I literally, right... Ten minutes before we came out here, had those few replies. I sent out over 200 texts. So let me ask this. This is not even a fair question to ask right now because is it possible? Oh, goodness, how can I say this without? Is it possible to be completely honest when I say, would you have replied if you could have? Yes. You would have? Okay, I believe you. You said you would. How many did not get the text this morning? <laughs> I 
Now, what I'll tell you is the reason you might not have gotten that text is because you have not opted in to accept them from the church. You have to opt in. So you have to text. Anyway, we'll, we'll deal with that another day. Not today. Not right now. So I'm going to be sending out an opt-in text to everybody. And let's see how many leave me on red. So, when I consider that I sent this text out of those who received it, only those responded that I mentioned. Outside of that, I thought to myself, this is really funny. Because here's what's true. Even those of you that are in this room that would have responded, there are those that wouldn't have even, they wouldn't have even said, what does that mean? I've been chosen. What does that mean? How does that work? Or, did you mean that for me? So, how often do we leave Yahweh on red? How often do we leave Him? He sends us messages. He sends us signs. He sends us wonders. He sends us moments of engagement. And we disregard them. Or we look at it and we think, I'll get to it. I can tell you this is one thing for sure that separates God from you and me. There's many things, but this one thing for certain. It's true of humankind that when someone sends, our, sends us a text, it may or may not be something that needs to be replied to right now because most of the time when they send a text, people send texts, it's a moment of thought. It doesn't require an immediate response. But when the Father, if He ever messages you, it's always important. It always requires an immediate response, an immediate change, an immediate agreement, an immediate yes and amen. Is anybody hearing me this morning? So again, I asked the question, how often have we left him on red when he's reached out to us one way or another or tried to point us in a different direction? And I'm going to just tell you right now, I can tell you as it relates to many areas in our lives, one of the biggest challenges I see in the church world today relates to a subject that is uh, it's a covenant that is worldwide and yet is not entered into often with His Word in mind. It's marriage. How often have I sat in my office and I've done... Now, there's a lot of people that have gone into marriage and I've never had the opportunity to counsel them or they never received counsel, so they didn't know what they were getting into when they got into it. And they got into it and it became what it became. But how I, don't, I can't even tell you how often I've sat in my office and I've said to every person who I've ever counseled premarital in my office before they were married, and I've sat in there and I've said to them, you need to make sure you have heard the word of the Lord. Because he does not send and then repent of his sending. And make sure we reply to the word of the Lord when he sends and he's giving us messages for those that before they engage in marriage, if he's giving any red flags at all and he's trying to get your attention, don't leave him on red. I got your nudge, but I'm going to ignore it because I really like him. I really like her. Your nudge is good, but my want's better. Is anybody hearing me this morning? And I use that because that's one of the most common things where I believe, from my experience in 30-some years of ministry, where that's one of the most common areas where people tend to leave Yahweh on red to say I don't have peace but I'm going to supplant my peace with faith it's not possible faith and peace are synonymous I don't have peace about this but I have faith that you're going to redeem it 
if we even have to get to the place where we're saying, I don't have peace, but I have faith that you'll redeem it, that's a first indication that he said, this is not the one. Is anybody hearing me in this room? So if I'm leaving him on red and Yahweh's trying to get my attention, I guess let me establish it by saying this. Let me justify that question this way. Can you accept that nobody more than God has your best interest at heart? Can you accept that this morning? That there is nobody that wants you to succeed and do well more than God Himself. We can accept that. If I can accept, if I'm a believer, I can accept I've received Jesus Christ, I'm beginning to interpret the ways that the Father speaks to me, whether it's through an audible voice, whether it's through an unction, whether it's however He may speak to me, whether it's through a moment, a series of events, somebody says something, whatever it might be, but something strikes in me, and I know this is word and purpose. This is Him speaking to me. If I can accept He's in control of everything, He has best interest in heart when He speaks to me, why would I ever disregard His message? Are you hearing me today? There's a reason, I think, that it, we find it easy to disregard His message. And we're going to talk about that. But it's because we don't understand what it is to actually talk to Him. But how do you think it makes Him feel when we disregard His message? I want to read Proverbs this morning, chapter 1. I don't think I'm going to read it all, uh, James, so... Uh, uh, well, it should be 24 through 33. Okay, 24 through 33. Proverbs 1, verse 24 reads like this: "Because I have called and refused to, li- because I have called and you refused to listen, I've stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you've ignored all of my counsel and would not have any of my appro- reproof, I'm going to laugh at your calamity." That, that sounds harsh. And I don't, I don't want this to sound, I want this to be uplifting this morning. But sometimes in order to get to the uplifting part, you got to go through the mud. Because I've called and you refuse to listen, have stretched out my hand and no one has listened, heeded. Because you've ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I'm going to mock when terror strikes you. In fact, when terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, I'm going to mock. I'm going to laugh. And at that time, people will call on me and I'm not going to answer. They're going to seek me diligently, but they will not find me because I don't want them to want me when there's calamity. I don't want them to read my messages, my texts when there's calamity. I want them to hear me all the time. I want people to trust me on the best day, and I want people to trust me on the worst day. If they don't trust me on the best day, then they certainly don't trust me on the worst day. And then if we go on, go, skip down, uh, go to verse 34. I mean, not 34, go to the next verse, 31. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Keep going. I don't have the rest of these in here. I want to go to all the way. For the simple are killed by their turning away and the complacency of fools destroy them. Verse 33. But this is important. But whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Man, that's good. Leave it up there for a second. Leave it up there the whole time. But whoever listens to me, does not leave me on red, will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. Everybody say, whoever listens to him. him. But whoever listens to him. Here's the problem, I think. This is developing. I'm talking out loud. I'm thinking out loud. I'm growing out loud. I'm learning out loud. Can Can we take that journey together? Here's the challenge, I think. I think the reason people have a hard time listening to God is because they haven't learned how to simply talk to God. 
There's many reasons why people don't talk to God because often, one of them is, because I think that often we're waiting for Him to do something so spectacular in our life to prove Himself, and then I'm going to take the time to have a conversation. Show me your miracles first. Does this sound familiar? Second Testament. Show me your miracles first, and then we'll believe. And he said, blessed are those who don't need miracles to believe. (laughs) Who only by faith trust. So it's because of a lack of knowing or engaging in conversation with him that so many don't hear. I can say this. This is not a thought I'm having. This is a confident 100% certainty in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, in my world. It is this. Those who talk to God, He 100% of the time talks back. He will at times talk to people who are not talking to Him. But 100% of the time, He talks to those who talk to Him. Say this with me. 100% of the time, time, He talks to those those who talk to Him. him. So as I speak and as I teach this morning, I said something to, we have Presbytery the first Sunday of every month and we had Presbytery meeting, which is the elders of the church. And we met last Sunday after service, and as we sat there and we were talking, I was sharing with, this, with them some of what Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and I said to them, I said, if I could just teach, and I, ta- I said this also on Friday night, I've, I've said it a lot of times since he first started developing this in me. But I made this comment, I said, if I could simply teach everyone to talk to God, I would not need to teach anything else. Let me drill it down. If I could teach people to talk to God, not once in a while, but to commune with Him, grow a relationship with Him through conversation. If I could teach people to talk with God, I would never have to teach on sin. I would never have to have an appeal for people to get saved. Is anybody hearing me? Just, tr- just walk with me. If I could teach people to talk to God, there would never be another need for someone to come and sit in an office and say, I need counsel. I'm, I'm drilling down here. Okay. Listen, the gospel is simple. This message is simple, and yet at the same time, it has so many tributaries. I want to explore them all. So, because people don't talk to Him, don't generally have conversations with Him, don't open up with Him, because they don't do that, they're not hearing anything. There's nothing coming back. Because the Father is waiting to hear your heart from you. The Father is waiting to hear what moves you from you. The Father wants to know what you love from you. He knows what you love within Him. But He wants to know from you. What you love. He can stand back and make a judgment on whether or not any of us worship Him. But how much simpler is it for those of us, which is all of us, that He created to be worshipers? If we worship Him, 
with our conversation. And in that conversation, he never has to wonder, am I being worshipped? But I'm going to inhabit the worship, the conversation. I'm going to indwell that conversation that these sons and daughters are having with me. Are you seeing this picture? If you're in this room, you're listening to me, you're you're watching online today, wherever you are, and you're hearing the words that I'm speaking today, and you're wondering, how come God, I haven't heard the voice of God in a long time, and, and whether or not you hear it audibly, or whether or not you hear it through a nudge, or whether or not you hear it through butterflies, that's irrelevant. But I want to tell you, He speaks in a way that you know it's Him, however that might be. I have never heard the audible voice of God. Never. Not one time in my life, but I have seen him in visions. I've seen him and he has talked to me in dreams. He has nudged me. However he speaks to you, it will be in a way you understand and know it's him. But I can tell you this. If you are not hearing the voice of God, it is because he's waiting on you. I'm going to say it again. If you're... If you are one who says, he never talks to me, never speaks to me, never... My question to you would be, do you talk to him? And when you do, how do you talk? Where are you, God? In the middle of my calamity? His response, if he were going to talk, would be, I'm exactly where I was when you weren't in calamity. Waiting on you to acknowledge that I'm not just... Your band aid. I'm your life giver. James 4 2 says this. We read this Friday night when we finally got there. It took us a while. Those of you that were here Friday night, thank you for coming. James 4 2 says this says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Boy, these scriptures are really intense this morning. <laughs> thank you for coming to the rock. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have for this reason, because you do not, you do not ask. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not act. And the moral of the story is doing anything without him ends badly. Doing anything. Somebody say doing anything. No, I need you to hear me this morning. Because what we've done, what humankind has done, what believers have done, is we've trained ourselves into these routines and ruts and places. We've trained ourselves into these, into these pathways that are so consistent, we don't even consider whether there's a pathway right beside it that holds within it a greater blessing. So we begin to journey down this path and we've grown so comfortable in these places and we've, we move so easily through the known that if we're not careful, if we've already gotten there maybe, we don't even feel the need to even have a conversation with Him because that path is so trodden and so worn down and filled with past blessing. No new blessing, no present blessing, but it's filled with past blessing and we've begun to allow that to satisfy. We become complacent in what He did without recognizing He still wants to do. We don't engage Him in conversation. I'm so thankful for... And even our prayers go that way. I'm so thankful for all that you have done. And the whole time, He's saying, are you also thankful for what I'm already working on? You haven't arrived at yet? Can you bless me for that? Can you worship me for what hasn't come to pass yet? Can you honor me for what I'm, I'm going to release to you in about three minutes? Can you honor me for the revelation that's being released to you right now? When do the blessings of the past become 
a hindrance to our future. When do the God movements of our yesterday become an obstacle to the God movements of our today and tomorrow? When do the miracles of last week become a hindrance to the miracles He wants to do right now and tomorrow? They become a hindrance when our focus is on what He has done and we stop talking because we're just basking in it. Woo! This is so good! You have done so many good things in me, I just am going to relax in that. And the whole time the Father's saying, please don't stop talking. Please don't stop talking. Listen, when I had come to the point that I wanted to, I had accepted that I was going to be a husband because I lived a long time, I didn't want to marry. But when I finally, Holy Spirit got a hold of me, He introduced my wife to me and changed everything. I won't go there right now. But when I had come to the place where I knew marriage is for me and I wanted children, you know what I can say is true? The moment my daughter Kaylee, my oldest daughter, was born and I held her in my hands, I did, I did rejoice. I did say I blessed them. I blessed my kids, every one of them. When I first held them in my hands, I, I spoke my voice over them just like I did my grandbaby. But I looked at my child Loved her immediately and began to give thanks. Now, I could have done two things. Two things could have happened here. I could have looked at little Kaylee in my arms and I could have said, It's complete. All is well. But inside of me, even while looking at my first child who was moments old, there was something in me that said, And there's more to come. And as I prophesied over Kaylee, I prophesied over who she would be. Not only the kind of daughter you're going to be, but the kind of sister. You're you're moments old and you're already in my mind a sister. You are a sister. And there isn't even a twinkle in my eye about the next one yet, but there is a word in my heart. So if I could teach people to talk to Him, I'm going to just address you today under the sound of my voice. If I could teach you. Now you might say, I do talk to Him and I know how to talk to Him. You don't need me to teach. You don't need to teach me to talk to Him. And maybe that's true. But maybe if I keep addressing you, you will see ways that you could talk to Him more. More meaningfully. So if I can come to the place where I am having communication with Him, and and again, I'm thinking out loud, but I am talking to the Father and I am releasing what is in me and I'm just, and I'm giving thanks and I'm not focused on what's behind me, but I'm, I'm giving thanks for what hasn't even come yet. I'm acknowledging to Him that I am aware that He isn't only a God of yesterday. He's also a God of today and tomorrow. Are you hearing me this morning? What does that mean for you? What does that mean for the people under the sound of my voice today? What does that mean for you? That means talk to Him. It's for lack of talking. We go back to James 4 too. He said you don't have, you want it so bad, you go get it and you get murdered. You, or you murder, you kill for it. You want something else so bad, you covet it, you're jealous for it, so you go and you steal it. And he said, all you had to do is ask me. In other words, if you'd have asked me, I'd have shown you what you really needed and you wouldn't have gone after the things you didn't need and it wouldn't have brought you to a place of unrighteousness. We end up in unrighteousness because we're not listening to what he's saying. And a lot of times we're not listening to what he's saying because we don't recognize his voice. And I guess if I wanted to, again, talk out loud, which I'm doing, I wonder, does he recognize our voice? When you speak, does he have to get used to it? I used an example that I'm going to use again today. I used it Friday night. 
But I used this example. It was off the cuff, but it was an example anyway. I'm going to use it again. Of a measuring cup and a telescope. And so often, too often, people will take a measuring cup, a glass or whatever it might be, and it has all the different uh, places on it, the little the, um, measurements on it. Well, I don't know why I couldn't get that. <laughs> has all the little measurements, because uh, I was thinking of the increments, something. But it has all those little spots on it, half cup, cup, whatever, ounces, whatever it is. has all those on there. We can take that thing, and too often people do this. Some of you in this room right now, you're going to recognize what I'm saying. It's going to sound so familiar to you, you're going to be like, ah, oh, it's me. <laughs> and you look through that measuring cup, and you see all these increments. You see all these different measurements, and, you, and, and when you look at it, you're looking at everything around you and everybody around you. And you measure yourself up by what you see. Oh, I'm half full compared to them. Oh, I'm about three ounces short. Oh, man, they're walking in that full blessing, and oh, my goodness. And we get fixated because we're focused on us. We're focused on what we want because if we're not talking to the Father, all of our attention is going to be directed at how can I get what I want? And do I measure up? with everyone around me. So we look through this measuring cup. Am I measuring up? Am I measuring up? And Yahweh's saying, will you put that down? Because I don't want you to measure yourself against anyone else. What I want you to do is I want you to take a telescope and I want you to hold that in your hand and I want you to look through that. And when you look through a telescope, it makes things that are far off become near. It makes things that are outside of your visibility suddenly become clear. If I look at the moon, I can look up there and I can see it with my naked eye when I'm looking out at it at night and I can see that and I can see that there's shades and what have you, but that's pretty much all I can see. But if I take a telescope and I look at the moon, I can see where meteors have impacted the moon. I can see the craters. I can see different formations. I can see the lines. And it suddenly becomes very clear and the Father says, when you talk to me, this is what I do. I remove the measuring cup. And you stop measuring yourself up by what others are doing, how others are getting by, what others are saying, how successful they are or aren't. You stop measuring yourself up by that. And when, I, when you put that cup down and you replace that with a telescope and you begin to look at the possibilities that are in front of you. Because I've created possibilities for you. I'm telling you, He's created possibilities for you. He's created possibilities for you that you haven't even yet accessed. You will never access if you don't talk to Him. They're there. This is what you need to know. Everything that some murder for is already there simply by asking. You don't have to kill for it. You kill for it because you're measuring yourself up against other things. You're doing this by the mind, not by the Spirit. You hear me this morning? So if I take that telescope and I'm looking out there and I'm saying, Father... I'm, I'm basking in, I'm talking to you, I'm going to have communication with you, and, and I'm going to watch things change. And as you begin to do that, suddenly things that are way off, way out, some of them are way outside of your visibility right now, but He begins to bring those into focus, and you begin to celebrate things that you know are coming to you in your spirit, even if you can't yet identify it. Like my children that were coming, as I lay hands on Kaylee and I prophesy over her, I was seeing in the distance the other children that were coming. I knew in my heart, Father, she's awesome, but she's not all. Sorry, Kaylee. <laughs> she's not the completion for me and my bride. I hope you'll get what I'm telling you this morning. The need for us, if I could teach you, if I can teach you today, how important it is to talk to Him. And not talk to Him like we do out of that same rut and rhythm and routine. Oh God! I, Archie, I loved how he said it Friday night when I asked if anybody had any comments. And he said, yeah, he said, now that, you know, I'm sitting here listening to you say what you're saying. And, and, he, and I said a lot of what I'm saying now Friday night. But he said, he said I realized as you're talking... I have a jumping off spot. 
So all of my prayers start with, Oh, Heavenly Father. Or Dear God. Or I don't know what all exactly he used, but it was something close to that. And the truth is, Archie, we all have that. Because we find ourselves in that rut and that rhythm and that, in that place where it's become so routine, we don't even give thought anymore. to it's, it's like we're not talking to God, we're talking to our past experience. And we're asking our past experience to show up in the present. And the Father's saying, your experience didn't do anything for you. It was me that did it. You're hearing me. I'm, ta- I'm just thinking out loud as we go. So I shared Friday night, and I've shared with somebody else. I shared that some time ago, we were at, our ho- at my home, and my family was gathered together, and I just shared with them. This is, I don't know how long ago this has been. It's been a while. But I shared with my family as Holy Spirit began to speak to me about recognizing Him in every moment. And talking to him as he began, he was starting to stir this thing, even though I didn't know how to identify it yet, he was starting to stir it. And I said to them, I said, I don't, I'm not going to pray. I'm never going to pray another routine prayer. I didn't even know, probably like you, don't even, didn't even realize you're praying, a, you're praying a routine prayer based on past experience. This is how I used to do it. This is how I'm still going to do it. I mean, we still teach our kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. Whatever it is. Well, not that one. There's parts of that I, I can't stand. A lot of that. But we teach, we, we, we develop this, this mode that what at one time was genuine was sincere. Not that your prayers aren't genuine and sincere, but I'm telling you, if you prayed the same thing today you prayed yesterday, you lost sincerity in it. I'm just being honest. It lacks sincerity. It lacks awareness of Him in your presence. Your present. So, I said we were sitting there and we we're getting ready to have dinner. And I said, I'm not going to pray the same anymore. I'm going to give thought. And I'm going to think about it. I'm gonna, because it was always, Father, I thank you for this. And, and, you know, whatever. I don't even know, remember now, what my routine prayer was. But I said, I'm not doing that anymore. So when I pray over my food now, I give thought. And the way that I do that, somebody asked the question. I won't say who it was, but somebody asked the question. It was Sam. I'll tell it. Sam. <laughs> He said, you know, when I pray over my kids, and when I pray over my daughter, and when I pray, he's got one on the way, when I pray over my wife, I find, and the only reason I'm doing this is because he said it in front of everybody Friday night. Is it okay, Sam, if I tell him? Okay. It's really awkward to ask for permission after I already. Sorry. He's my son, too, so they have to put up with more than a lot of people. But, the, um, but he said, you know, how do I... What do I do? You know, I realize when I pray for my wife and I pray for my daughter, it's not always exactly the same, but it's, it's pretty much the same, you know, line of thought and, and the consistency and, and what have you. And, and I, he said, I want it to be meaningful. You know, I want to know that I'm really speaking to the Father in regards to my wife and my children and my, whatever, you know, it might be. And I just shared with him and I shared with the group that was here Friday night. I said to them this, and, I, and I'm saying it to you right now. For me, when I begin to make an adjustment, I realized, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start drawing out of every day when I pray, whether it's for my food or for something, I'm going to draw a specific thing out of that day that Yahweh did for me, and I'm going to honor Him for that. I'm going to recognize, I'm going to, it's, going to, it's going to require me to be conscious of the fact that this is not a routine. It's going to require me to consider What has he done today? And I'm going to say, I'm going to honor him in my prayer for that. And if I do that, and I do, if I do that now, every time I pray, and every time I'm reaching out to him, and every time I'm talking to him, changes everything. Because now he knows, you're not just talking to me out of what you talked to me about before. You're coming to me with something that's coming straight from your heart. You've considered me, and you've considered that I'm capable of doing what you're speaking. You had to consider that. Do you hear me this morning? So when I look through that telescope, and the Father wants to reveal all of this to me, I'm going to tell you what He wants. The answers that He wants to give you are not going to come to you without talking to Him. Whether you know Yahweh today, whether you've received 
Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior today. Whether you even fully believe that He is God or He is not, I can tell you this emphatically and plainly truly true. If you do not believe that God exists, it's not because He hasn't tried to show you. If you will talk to Him, He will make Himself aware to you. But you then need to recognize that it's Him. And by faith know, this thing that I feel, I'm no longer going to accredit to good vibes. Or what do they call that in the room? The uh, Zen. <laughs> Witchcraft. You have to recognize, I'm talking to him. He's going to talk to me. Now here's the thing. You say, but I don't know how to talk to him. Yes, you do. I shared an example this morning with, there were several things that were said and I said, this morning, we've all been there, where we've gone to lunch with someone, dinner with someone, we've had somebody over for whatever, for whatever, just to visit with someone. You don't know them well, maybe, and, or maybe you do know them well, but you've never spent time together. So you get together, you make arrangements, and either you're at dinner, you, anyway, somehow you come together. And we've had these experiences where we come together with somebody and man, the conversation is easy and everybody's talking and this one's asking questions, making statements, making comments, making observations. Then the other is making the same thing and it's super simple and man, time flies. I mean, it is just whew, and suddenly you realize, oh my goodness, it's time to go. You know, we got we to gotta go and it's like, wow, that was amazing. And you, you tell the people you were with that was amazing. And then we also have these experiences where you get with someone. And they're in your presence, they're at your lunch, they're at your dinner, you've invited them or they've invited you. And you get there and you're just like, how are you? Everything's good? You know, you, thank you for inviting me, thank you for coming. And there's silence. They just stare at you for an hour and a half. <laughs> Anybody been there? Oh, yeah. You're just afraid to admit it because you were with them last night. But you sit across the table and you're talking and you're thinking, now you had one experience where you're sitting there and you're talking, you're carrying on, you're fellowship with one another and time flew and you've got suddenly you're in a situation where you're sitting there and you're staring at people that aren't communicating back, aren't talking back and the clock is... And I'm just being honest and in the back of your mind you're thinking, I'm ready for this to be over. And it's not because you don't like the people. It's because there's lack of communication. I wonder what that's like with Yahweh. I wonder if he sits there sometimes, if he's working and waiting and, and looking forward to getting to know us, and then because of a lack of feedback, a lack of conversation, a lack of observation, a lack of statement, a lack of even inquiry, it, because there's a lack, he's thinking, this is really hard. How easy do we make it? To know him, for him to know us. I can tell you, he made it very easy for us to know him. If you're here this morning sitting and you're listening to what I'm saying and you're in the situation I'm about to address, I want to tell you there's a pathway out. You're not hearing the Father. Nothing seems to be, we sang that song this morning, I don't remember the exact words, but when you're in the fire, wherever you are, and He's got a way out. It's so true. But you can choose to do something. You can choose. We can choose to no longer, to just to keep going like we are and, and not talk to Him or, or to have a relationship that is mundane. Someone even mentioned it this morning. They said, you know, sometimes when people are married for a long time, they get into this pattern, this rhythm. And suddenly the excitement is gone. They stop asking questions. What happens when whether you've been married for a year or five years or 30 years or 50 years? What happens? If all of a sudden you begin to make a decision, you begin to consciously say, Man, we've been together for 50 years. I am certain there's things about my husband, my wife, I don't know. And you just, and you consciously do this. 
Babe, we've been together a long time. And I haven't asked you this in a long time. But tell me something about you that I don't know. <laughs> well, babe, you know everything about me, but I don't. Press! What made you happy this week? What made you sad this week? Outside of me. <laughs> what motivated you this week? What makes you have butterflies? Or simply coming out and saying, I don't want to have the kind of relationship where we just assume we know where each other is going to be and what each other might say. I don't want an assum assumption relationship. I want one of those relationships that are exploratory. What don't I know? What don't I know? What don't you know? I can tell you the Father wants the same thing. And when we talk to Him, He will begin to tell us things we did not even imagine. He will begin to release to us things that are far beyond what our greatest dream was. We begin to see, when we talk to Him, He knows how important it is to us. We show Him how important it is to us to know Him. So I said, when I was talking about prayer Friday night, I said... And he didn't know I was going to call it. Well, he, he, he had a feeling. But Archie said, you know, I start all my prayers. I have this jumping off spot. Dear God, <laughs> Heavenly Father. How many have a jumping off spot? Be honest. How many have a jumping off spot? Yeah, even when you pray over your food. You have a jumping off spot. So I said, Archie, conclude service to the, our time tonight to, with prayer. He said, man, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> so you know what he did? I loved it. Exactly what I'm hoping for. He simply began to talk. You know, today I was thinking about you, the Father, and you couldn't even tell that it was even a prayer when he began. It was just him talking to the Father, reflecting on the goodness of God. And he said, you know, I was just thinking the other day, I was thinking this morning that, you know, what you did in me and, you know, I, and it was as though he were telling all of us. And he was doing all of this and saying all of this and then, and, and, and I, it, it was a sense that, okay, the prayer hasn't begun yet. You know why? Because we're trained. The prayer begins with a dear Heavenly Father. And then he he just reflected on the goodness of God for a few minutes and he said, Amen. And everybody in the room said, Amen. Why? Because he consciously made the decision, I'm about to commune with you. And it's never been written on paper, nor has it been written and etched in, the, in my mind. I'm about to say to you what I've never said in this way. I could have said it many other ways, but I've never said it like this in about this moment. And I'm going to tell you something. When we begin to do that, yeah. Yahweh says, you have my yeah. undivided attention. Mm -hmm. You have my undivided attention. Watch what I can do with that. Because I'm hearing every single word that you have to say. So, what do I do with that today? Talk to Him. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to talk about meditation. What does it mean? Because sometimes communion with the Father isn't audible. It's not words that we speak. It's the time that we take. Do you hear me today? So what do I hope you got out of this? That you understand that talking to God is the most important thing that you can do. If you're talking to Him, if we are talking to Him, the calamities that we find ourselves in, without it, without talking to Him, we wouldn't find ourselves in. The trouble we get into 
we get into because we stop listening to him when he sends his angel to say, don't go here. We get into that trouble because we stopped listening to His voice. But I'm going to hear His voice when I pay attention to who He is and when I talk. I choose. Say this with me. I choose choose to to talk. And let me wrap it up with this. You might be in here. This is my first wrap up. You might be present and not even remember the last time you actually did talk to Him. It might be true that the only time you talk to Him is right before you eat your food. My hope is that that will never be true again. You might be one that can say, I don't even know if I've ever prayed. Someone watching online, someone in this room might be true. I don't know that I've ever even actually talked to God. I hope that after this morning, that will never be true again. We serve the living God who wants to change you and me in ways we cannot comprehend outside of Him. Do you believe that this morning? Stand with me if you would, please. If you're following along in the notes, I made this statement at the end of the, the message, or the, the, the bottom, and I said, for people without faith in God, He is a question mark. People who have not believed in Him, who have not trusted in Him, He becomes a question mark. How do you remove the question mark? You talk.